I believe that God has given me a word for you in this message series. Solomon said in the book of Proverbs that a word fitly spoken in due season is like apples of gold and pictures of silver. And I believe that the word that God has for you and I in this series is a word from his heart, and it's a word of inspiration. It's a word that will uplift you and I and launch us into the end of this year and to prepare us for 2016. And this is the word, a shift is coming your way. How many of you believe that this morning? But for that shift to come, you've got to have a vision for your life, a vision for your work, your finances, your family, your relationships, a vision for your future. And as we established last week that in the book of Proverbs, chapter 29, verse 18, the scripture says Solomon, as he was moved by the Holy Spirit, said that without a vision, people perish. Did you catch that? If you don't have a vision, you are going to miss God's best for your life. You're going to miss the shift that is going to take you to the next level, and there is a next level that God has for you and me. Because you know what? We are a work in progress. We have not yet arrived. We have not yet completed. We have not yet finished. Jesus said, he that endures to the end shall be saved. Anybody can start a race, but how many of you know that there's no rewards given at the starting line? Where do you find the rewards? Where do you experience the victory and the promotion? It's at the finish line. So as the scripture says, God's promise to you and I is is that the work that he began in us, he will be faithful to complete it. Let there be no mistake, you and I are a work in progress. He is taking us, as the scripture says, from glory to glory, from one level to another. And I don't know about you, but I am not going to be satisfied with being stuck at a certain level. I'm not going to be satisfied, and you shouldn't be satisfied, with being stuck in a place of mediocrity, not settling for second best in your life. God has a bigger, he's got a better that he has for you. In our movie clip this morning, based on the true life story of Daniel, Rudy, Rudiger, this was a young man who was the ultimate underdog, an undersized wannabe who dreamed of playing football for Notre Dame College. And to really appreciate his story, you have to understand that uh, this was a young man who was 5'6 and who weighed 165 pounds and had a dream of attending Notre Dame University and playing, one day walking out on the field with a uniform on, part of the Notre Dame football team. So not only was his challenge the fact that he was incredibly undersized and under-talented, but he didn't have the grades to even get in. He had to go for two years to a junior college. He attended Holy Cross just to qualify to make it in his junior and his senior year, only to discover that during that time, the reason why he had struggled his whole life educationally is because he had uh, dyslexia. And so they worked on that. Uh, Eventually, he was accepted to Notre Dame and was able to play on the football team because he had a vision. He was able to see what his family couldn't see. He had actually actually zero support from his family, another obstacle. Some of you today, you see the possibilities for the future, but you've, you've got obstacles in your way. You've got little support from your family. But you know what? I'm here to tell you that there is something in you that God wants to bring out of you that has the potential to affect and to change your future if you'll embrace it, if you'll receive it. In spite of the obstacles, God says... I can do something with your future. So here's my question for you today. What do you see from where you are standing as you've come to church today, as we are meeting on this first day of the week? For at least seven times in Scripture, God asks the question, what do you see? Because he understands the power of how vision can affect the future. We discussed and discovered last Sunday that the number one most significant character trait of vision is the ability to see. Say that with me this morning. 
the ability to see. It's what all visionary leaders have in common. It's what moved David from being a shepherd to becoming a king. 1 Samuel chapter 17, David had this incredible ability to see what others couldn't see. If you study David's life, you'll remember that when the prophet Samuel came to Jesse's home, Jesse was David's father, he said, I want you to line up all your sons because God sent me here. One of them's going to be the next king. God was displeased with King Saul. Saul was not following his instructions. God gave him multiple opportunities, and, and he refused. So God decided he was going to pick another king. So Jesse brought all of his sons and lined them up. Samuel walked and passed in front of each one of them, and not one of them was the chosen one. He said, do you have any other sons? Because I'm not finding, I'm not seeing who the next anointed king is. He goes, well, yeah, I've got a teenage son who's out, you know, on the back nine tending sheep. He said, go get him. David was just a teenager. Jesse brought David, and immediately when Samuel laid eyes on David, he knew this was God's chosen one, and he anointed David as a teenager. But David went back, and he just kept tending sheep. Nothing changed until one day, a conflict arise between the Philistines, the arch enemies of Israel, and the Israelites. And they got into this conflict and they, they set up camp in a valley. They were on opposite eye sides of the mountain. And in the valley, a man came down and challenged the Israelites. His name was Goliath. And he was speaking a language that they understood. It's called representative warfare. He said, listen, you send me a man. He'll represent you, I'll represent the Philistines, and we'll fight, and whoever wins gets all. For 40 days and 40 nights, Goliath came down into that valley, and he challenged, as a man of stature, as a giant, he challenged the elite of the Israeli army and King Saul. And for 40 days and 40 nights, there was no answer because they were literally paralyzed by fear. Jesse sends David because three of David's brothers are on the front lines to bring them food and to check on their well-being. David shows up, begins to walk with his brothers, and out of nowhere... Goliath shows up, and he hears Goliath taunt King Saul. He hears Goliath curse them. He can feel the fear and how it's paralyzed the camp. And his brothers begin to tell David how that the king has promised to make a man who can take on Goliath rich and to give that man, if he wins the hand of his daughter, and to boot, that man's entire family would be exempted from taxation forever. And David began to listen and assess the situation. Why? Because that's what visionary leaders do. They're able to see what other people can't see. And David began to ask his brothers again, tell me again what the king has promised. David's listening, and he's hearing, and he's seeing, and he's assessing the situation. He's looking at the bigger picture. God's doing something in David's heart. And this is what he says to his brothers. He says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that, channels, that challenges the armies of the living God? Why? Because David could see what his brothers were not seeing. He was seeing what Saul could not see, that this was not just a battle between the Philistines and the Israelites. This was Satan who was challenging God himself. And this is what he says to his brothers after they try to quiet him and rebuke him because he keeps asking over and over, what is the king promised? How is it that nobody's responding? This is what David says. Here's vision. Here's David saying. He says, is there not a cause? Doesn't anybody else see the big picture, what's happening here? What is your cause? 
What is it that is outside of yourself that is bigger than you, that is compelling and bringing the best out of you in the present, in the future? Thoreau said, most men live lives of quiet desperation. And they take their best song that is in them to the grave. Church vision is about getting that song out, bringing the best out of you in this life and in the life to come. See, he saw victory when everybody else saw fear. What is fear? It's false evidence appearing real. And that has a voice, and that paralyzes. It blurs our vision. Nobody could see it. Except a teenage shepherd boy who had been meeting with God, whose eyes God had opened about the possibilities of the future. And I'm here to tell you that the opposite of fear is faith. Faith can see what the natural eye cannot see. How do we know that? Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. You don't want to miss this. You need to, to memorize this scripture. Hebrews chapter 11, 1 says, Now faith is the evidence of things not seen. With what? The natural eye. The evidence of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. Why? Because there is such a thing as the eye of faith, the ability to see the possibilities of what might be in the future as God is working in and through a person's life, God working in and through a set of circumstances. Where do we see? We see into the future. See, fear shuts that ability down. Fear limits your ability to see yourself getting bigger, getting better, having a greater impact, getting healthier, getting stronger, getting whole, getting on top of your game. See, when God touches our lives and the word of God and the spirit of God is working in us and through us, we begin to see things that we cannot possibly see. We spend so much time in life, we spend so much time in our culture waiting for the future to happen to us rather than us creating and defining our future. Isn't that true? Think about how many movies have come out about the future happening to us. Blade Runner, The Terminator, The Matrix, The Road, The Book of Eli, The Last Man on Earth. All movies about the future happening to us. But Lynn and I saw a movie this weekend that did the exact opposite. It's a movie about changing the future. How many of you believe that small changes in thought, in word, and in action have the potential to change the future? So we saw the movie Tomorrowland. Tomorrowland is about changing the future. It's kind of got mixed reviews, but Tomorrowland is an alternate reality where nothing is impossible in the future. It's a separate Dimension, a place that was created so that the world's best and brightest, most positive thinkers can come together without being hindered by politicians and bureaucracies and conflict and reaching for the, the best possible future that might be. In Tomorrowland, there's a man named Frank Walker who builds a machine called the Monitor. And the monitor is able to kind of take the past, the present, and images from the future to predict the future. And it can predict the future with 100% accuracy. So he builds the monitor only to discover that the world is going to self-destruct in 58 days. That humanity is going to turn on itself. It's going to implode. And he loses all hope. Becomes a bitter man. And then... By chance, a girl comes into his life named Casey Newton, who is an intellectual optimist, who when she discovers this 58-day projection and discovers this machine, absolutely refuses to believe that the future cannot be changed. 
And in the machine that's monitoring, and there's a, there's a countdown taking place, and you can see that there's a projection going on mathematically, it's 100% accurate, that when she shows up and meets Frank Walker, it drops down to like 99.98%, meaning that there is a chance that the future can be changed. There's hope that the future can be different. Do you know that the devil spends 24-7 trying to get you to believe in your mind and your heart that things will never change for your future? He is bombarding your mind and your heart with thoughts to try to entangle you, distract you, and to deceive you into believing things are not going to improve and that you're going to be stuck where you are for a very long time. And I'm here to tell you that when Jesus shows up on the scene and God's spirit falls fresh on you, you know what? There is no longer a 100% prediction in your life that you're going to be stuck in mediocrity and change is going to continue to elude you. You're going to keep coming up short. Things will never be different. You know what happens? It begins to drop the hope and the possibility starts coming alive on the inside of you. And then Casey discovers, being the, the big picture person that she is, that the monitor is actually creating feedback. It's obtaining information about the future that is being uh, introduced back into a time flow that is actually creating a self-fulfilling prophecy. Prophecy. It's, it's putting thoughts into people's minds and heart that is actually creating the outcome that it was predicting. And that in order for that to change, the monitor had to be destroyed. It had to be eliminated. It had to be wiped clean. So the question is, are we waiting for the future to happen against us like Saul did? Or are we going to take charge of the future like David did and begin to change it, begin to change the outcome, to begin to change the possibilities of what might be as we get connected to God and to begin to embrace the destiny in the future that he has for us. David was a man with not only a great vision, but he had a great imagination. And it's so important to understand, and we just, we just kind of leaned into this a little bit last week, that imagination is the mechanism by which God enables us to see with the eye of faith. It's the mechanism that enables us to see the possibilities for the future, to have vision. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, the scripture says that God is able to do it immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine. And you want to circle that word imagine. He said, according to the power that is working in us. Why? Because as Christ followers, as believers, God wants us to know that when we came to Christ, God deposited his spirit within us. The Holy Spirit was joined with our spirit. And the capacity for us to imagine and to see things in the future was, was exponentially accelerated. You have the Holy Spirit in you, and you have a power that is constantly working to release your best on the inside out into the future, into the real world. And so the enemy comes in and he tries to distract, he tries to marginalize, he tries to limit those possibilities, and the Holy Spirit is constantly working to try to fill your mind and heart with, with thoughts of of what might be if you'll just stay connected to him, if you'll allow him to work in you. As the scripture says, both to will and to do the Father's good pleasure. By definition, imagination is the act or power of forming a mental image of something not present to the senses or never before whole, wholly perceived in reality. And it's out of those mental images that we see that we visualize, that we dream, that we create, that we pursue, that we build, that we change, that we make a difference, that we change the future. Doctors and psychologists tell us that there are three components to our subconscious. Memory, which deals with the past. Contemplation, which deals with the present. 
Some of you are contemplating your situation today, hoping, looking for a breakthrough, a release, a change, something that you can hold on to that will get you through the week to come. And the number three, imagination, which deals with the future. You use your imagination. No other aspect of creation was given the capacity to imagine, to see into the future, except human beings. It's a unique gift that God has given to us as we were created in his image and his likeness. Through your imagination, you are planning and reading and writing and daydreaming and painting and cooking and decorating and designing and your goal setting and your vision creating. That's by God's design. That's God's intention. Are you satisfied with where you are today? Do you have a vision of a better preferred future? Because that's what vision is. It's a preferred future. It's a better future that you can work towards. So, in other words, imagination can be your greatest resource or it can be your greatest, uh, your greatest adversary. Because there is such a thing as good imaginations and bad imaginations. Good imaginations give birth to good visions. Bad imaginations give birth to bad visions that bring outcomes that create hurt and pain and brokenness in people's lives. In Genesis chapter 11, God looked down upon man who came to a point where that man was united in, in mind and heart and purpose. And man had determined to build a tower towards heaven. Somehow they must have had access to some technology or resources that would enable them to, to connect with heaven itself. And, and God said within himself, he said, let us go down and see what man is doing. It was referred to as the Tower of Babel. And the way that God stopped that which they had imagined and had a vision to do. That's what, what they saw and set out to accomplish. Evidently it was going to happen. God said, we need to stop it. So the way God stopped it was by confusing their language. He attacked their communication system. And out of it came the many multi-languages of the world as we know it today. And that's the very way that the enemy tries to keep you from moving forward and pursuing your vision. You know what he does? He attacks the communication system. He attacks what's coming into your mind, what's coming into your heart. He attacks your conversation. He gets you to start speaking not words of life, but words of death. Why? Then you begin like a self-fulfilling prophecy to act out and move towards an outcome that he has designed for your life in contrast to what God has designed for your life. And that is a process that is constantly working. In fact, it's a battle that rages in our hearts and our minds. The enemy's trying to attack and get access to your imagination, to your creative abilities, to your ability to see, because he knows it will affect the outcome of your future. It's time for God's people in the church to stand up and take the bull by the horns and to say, listen, we are no longer going to be victims at the hands of an undetermined future. We are going to take control of our future. We are going to, with God's help and God's direction and in the context of his sovereignty, we're going to, we're going to take charge of our future. We're going to change the outcome. We're going to make a difference. We're going to make an impact. We can make a better world if we will allow God to work in and through us. But we have to understand the difference between the, the good imaginations and the bad imaginations. Because it's evident in Scripture. When Judas betrayed Jesus, it's evident that he had spent some time planning and imagining the outcome of that betrayal. To only, after it was all over with, have terrible regret to the point of taking his own life. The scripture tells us that when there are imaginations that do not speak to a good future, to a God future, the only appropriate way for you and I to deal with those imaginations is that we're to cast them down and we're to cast them out. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, this is about spiritual warfare. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 tells us in 
Verses 4 and 5, that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the what? Pulling down of strongholds. Doing what? Casting down imaginations. And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So every imagination, every thought, every argument that is contrary to God's highest and best for your life, to the preferable future, to the destiny that God has for you, according that he's revealed to us in his word and that he reveals to us by his spirit as he as he speaks to us and through us in our minds and our hearts. He said, there's only one appropriate response. You need to take it captive. You need to, to tear it down. You need to cast it out because it's counterproductive to your present and your future. See, there's really only two choices. As the scripture tells us in the book of Deuteronomy, God set before his people, he says, you choose either life or death. Jesus said, the thief comes to steal, kill, and to destroy, but I've come to give you life and to give it to you more abundantly. Why? Because the thoughts you imagine enable you to see and to create vision and to produce outcomes which in turn always alter the future. Satan doesn't want you to understand that process. He doesn't want you to get that revelation because he wants to control it. He wants to manipulate it. He wants to have charge of it. But when you get the knowledge, Hosea said, the prophet Hosea, God's people perish for lack of knowledge. When you come into that revelation and that knowledge, God's given you and I power to take charge of the process. That's why the scripture says that you need to guard your heart. Why? Because your mind is the doorway to your heart. And whatever you allow to be planted into your mind gets down into your spirit, into your heart, and that self-fulfilling prophecy starts to kick in, and you start acting, and you start talking, and moving in a direction where the outcome starts to play itself out. You see? And God wants you to take charge of it. Proverbs says, guard your heart, for out of it flows what? The very issues of life. The issues of the future. Right out of here. But it starts right here. See, the battleground is your mind, your imagination, what you're seeing about your present and about your future. In Tomorrowland, there's a great scene where Casey is talking to her dad. He's in the process of losing his job at NASA. He's a NASA uh, engineer, and of course, they're shutting the program down, and and he's discouraged. Casey, being that eternal optimist, says, Dad, you remember the story you used to tell me about the two wolves? He said the one wolf represented darkness and despair, and the other wolf represented light and hope. He said, you used to tell me that the two wolves are always fighting. And you'd always ask me the question, who wins? Church, who wins? It's the one that you feed the most. So when that battle is raging in your mind, you know, on one hand, Satan is saying, you know what, you're no good. You're never going to measure up. You're never going to get out of this situation. You've made so many mistakes in your past, it's over with. And then God comes along and says, you know what? Your best days are yet to come. I got a bigger and a better in this life and the life to come. You got to make a choice. Which one are you going to feed? Which one are you going to align yourself with? Which one are you going to nurture and allow to come alive? Do you realize that your imaginations and the picture frame of your mind are similar to that monitor in Tomorrowland in the sense that what it is projecting about the future is affecting the thoughts, the words, and the decisions you and I make every day, 24-7. And like a self-fulfilling prophecy, they're moving us towards creating and experiencing a vision for the future. That's why the scripture tells us in Proverbs chapter 3, as a man or woman thinks in their heart, so are they. Real powerful. The book of wisdom. As you think in your heart, so you will become. Listen to Proverbs chapter 4. Be careful what you think because your thoughts run your life. So here's my question. How do you see yourself today and in the future? Do you see yourself defeated? 
never recovering, never changing, forever stuck, never getting a second chance, never getting free, forever alone? Or do you see yourself winning, overcoming, starting over, moving higher, being promoted, entering into a new relationship, putting that addiction behind you once and for all? Do you see yourself picking up a ministry, making a difference in the world, affecting the generations that are coming behind you? Church, I believe that God sent me today to tell you that you've got untapped gifts talents and resources on the inside of you waiting to be released into the future right here today in our community there are college degrees waiting to be released there are books waiting to be written somebody reached out to me this last week and said you know what I'm starting that book I've been wanting to write for many years and I said yes see on the inside of you there's a new sound, a new business, a new invention, a new ministry, a new cause, a new idea waiting to be released that has the potential to not only change your life but your family, your community, the world that we live in. I want to challenge you today to enlarge your picture frame. Fill it with the right imaginations. Get God's vision for your future. See it. And establish a reference point, a reference point that can help you stay connected to it. Because sometimes when God promises something to you and I, sometimes when he puts something in our heart, there is a waiting period between what we see as a vision for the future becoming a reality down the road. And it's in the waiting period that the battle rages. That's why we said last week that God gave Abraham a promise, but he also gave him a picture. There's a great story in the book of Zechariah about a man named Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel was one of the leaders who was in the first waves of captives who came out of Babylonian captivity to come back into the city of Jerusalem. God spoke to Zerubbabel and said, I want you to rebuild my house. How many of you are thankful for this house of worship? We can call our own. God said, listen, the first thing I want you to do is you go back and you rebuild my house. You rebuild the temple. He gets to work, and after a couple of years, they got the whole foundation done. Some of the enemies of Israel come in and begin to distract them and fight them and attack them. He leaves off of building the temple for 17 years. It just stops. I wonder how many of you are here this morning and God gave you a vision and you launched out towards it, but you got in a battle. Something happened that distracted you. The enemy came in and there was a misfortune, a misalignment, a mistake that was made. And that thing has just been lying dormant. God sends the prophet Zechariah to Zerubbabel, says, listen, Zechariah chapter 4, verse 7, he says, you know what? That mountain that's before you, and the mountain represents in that passage all the obstacles that he was facing. He said, you know what? That mountain's going to become like a plane. I'm going to knock it down. God wants to knock down every obstacle in your life that is keeping you from going to the next level. I don't care how short you are in finances. I don't care how short you think you are in the talent. I don't care how many mistakes you've made in the past. If you're here and you're still alive, God's not done with you yet. The story's not over. God is writing your story. Church, you don't want to miss this. Next Sunday, man, we have got a Vision Sunday, and you know, we're going to tell some stories. God's given us some incredible stories here in the, in the last couple months about just people whose lives are being changed. I mean, just nothing short of miraculous. Zachariah said, listen, Zerubbabel, you know what you need to do? I want you to go get the headstone. I want you to go get the capstone. For those of you who know anything about building, the capstone is like the last stone that is supposed to be laid when the building is completed. He says, you're going to lay it. You are going to lay that stone because that building is going to be built. It's going to be completed. In fact, I want you to go get it. And I want you to set it before you as a reminder that I said it, I declared it, and I'm going to bring it to pass. Listen to me. You need a picture of something. You know, hang it on your wall. Put it on your keychain. 
Put it on your computer, on your desk. If you got a vision of building a home or starting that new business, having a child, building a relationship, you need to get a picture of it. For Rudy, it was that Notre Dame jacket. The guy wore that thing around wherever he went. It was like obnoxious. But for him, that was his reference point to say, everybody who's told me this is not possible, I believe it's possible. I believe in the impossibilities of life in the future. When we set out to build this building, we had a watercolor done of the building. In fact, we had our building designed by an architect. And when we got done looking at that drawing and running, we said, this, it's not it. That is not our building. Rip it up. Tear it up. We're starting over. We got a team of people together that said, this, this building needs to be an expression of, of our heart and our vision of who we are. You know what? We opened up the front lobby. We had a two-story lobby developed where light can come in because we wanted people to be lifted up. We wanted to have, we had a, a classroom over where the cafe is. We said, open it up. We want people to be able to stay and have community because you know what? We're losing community in our culture. And we want the grace of God to be able to touch people for as long as possible to make them better so that when they leave this community on a Sunday morning, they are better than when they came. This was a watercolor that was done of our building like five or six years before it was ever built. We didn't realize that it would take four years of all-out war in the zoning process here in Chesterland to get this building approved for us to build. I'm telling you, all hell broke loose. But you know what? We kept that picture in my office, and we looked at that thing for like over five years as a reminder that God said, I sent you here. I said, I want you to come out here. And I want you to... Build a house of grace, a spirit-filled community that would be a beachhead in a dark place. So we're going to close with this before we pray. You know, it was interesting. I, I didn't open this. She gave this to me last Sunday, but I, I didn't open it. And for whatever reason, I opened it as I'm walking out this morning. I said, oh my gosh, this, this is the ending of my message today. It was like the Lord just prompted me to open this. She said, Pastor Michael, thank you for your sermon yesterday. That was last Sunday. And if you missed last Sunday, you need to get that CD or watch it online. I'd like to tell you a story about envisioning ourselves in a positive situation. After 31 years of marriage, I found myself divorced, sad, and living alone. There was a bare spot on my living room wall and in my heart where a beautiful picture once hung. My former husband took the wall hanging where he left, and every night I stared at that spot crying and depressed. One evening after work, I was walking through the mall. I saw a painting that caught my eye, and I knew it would be perfect hanging on that awful bare spot. I couldn't afford the picture, but I bought it anyway. Took it home and hung it up. Awesome. The painting is of a couple. He is in a tuxedo. She's in a ball gown. They're dancing on the beach. They're in each other's arms, and they are obviously in love. From that night forward, I looked at that print and envisioned myself as that woman in the painting. I thought every night, someday, that will be me. A year or so went by and I carried on with my life. One weekend I made a retreat for Christian singles. It was a wonderful experience. On that weekend I felt the presence of God and the love of the Father. I forgave my former husband. I was finally at peace in my heart and in my soul. I knew then that God had a plan for me. She quotes Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11 which says, God speaking through the prophet Jeremiah, I know the thoughts I have towards you. People, my people, my sons and daughters, thoughts to prosper you, not to harm you. God's not here to hurt you. He's here to make you better. He says to give you a hope and a future. That's what she quotes. I was driving home on that Sunday afternoon. I made a deal with God. I told him that it was okay if he wanted me to be single, but if he sent me someone to love, would he please send me someone who dances? That was in January. In February 2003, I met my husband, Doug. We were attending a Valentine's dinner for singles at our church where we met the month before. As I was getting my coat and about to leave, I heard someone call my name. It was Doug. He asked me if I would consider going to dancing lessons with him to be his partner for the instruction. I hesitated, but then I remembered my deal with the father. Doug sensed my hesitation and said, 
come dance with me, please. Did I mention the name of the painting? It is Dance Me to the End of Love. The rest is history. Don't tell me that God's done and that your story's over. Thank you for listening to this message today, for visiting us online. We want you to know that all of the messages that we prepare, all of the messages that we preach are designed to give people an opportunity to receive into their hearts Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. If God touched you through this message today, if you feel like you have a need to get right with Him and reconnected to Him, I want to give you an opportunity to do that today. You can know that you know that you know if this was your last day on planet Earth, that heaven is your home, that you've got peace with God, that you're right with Him, that you've received the forgiveness of sins. How do you do that? You do that by praying the prayer of salvation. Romans chapter 10 tells us that if we believe in our hearts and we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus, we shall be saved. That's an incredible promise. It's a promise of God getting reconnected to His sons and daughters. It's about us getting right in our relationship with God. You can experience that miracle today, but it's a gift that God offers that cannot be bought, earned, or bargained for. John said about Jesus, for as many as received Him, He gave them the right, the power, and the privilege to become the sons and daughters of God. And so it's a gift that has to be received personally in your heart. You do that by praying and opening your heart to Him. Would you pray this prayer with me today, if you want that touch and that connection? Say, Lord Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for my sin. You rose from the dead on the third day. Lord, I invite you into my heart to be my Lord and my Savior. In Christ's name I pray. If you prayed that prayer today, God has set your life on a new course, a new spiritual journey that is going to be life-changing for you. It's going to be an exciting adventure that will be filled with hope and a whole new world of possibilities. There's some important things you need to do. Number one, you need to get into a good local church where you can get good Bible teaching, get into a community where you can begin growing with other believers. Start reading your Bible on a daily basis. Begin in the Gospel of John. If you don't have a Bible, download the Bible app or contact us through our website. We'll send you a New Testament so you can begin to make that connection. Start praying daily talking to God, letting Him know what your needs and your struggles are. And God will be there for you and start connecting with you in a personal way. And then I want you to tell somebody about what you've experienced and what's happened to you. If you're nearby, come and visit us on site. We'd love to have you come and join us for a Sunday morning celebration service. Linda and I and our staff would love the opportunity to personally connect with you and to meet with you. Thank you again for visiting us online and participating in this important service.